Good evening from Sweden and wherever you're joining us from around the world, welcome to Planet IMEX, the October edition. My name is Jane Cunningham and I'm delighted to be the moderator on this session today, hosted by Maritz Global Events. So thank you for taking the time to join us here for this exciting 45 minute session. Now we have a, pl a panel of superheroes here today and I really hope that you will gain some useful insights into uh, to hear about them and also about their world. So first of all, we have Karina Bauer, who is the CEO of the IMEX Group, but also has experienced uh, wing walking. Karina, is that right? Can you tell us a little bit? Yeah, uh, wing walking is when you get strapped to the top of an aeroplane. It's an open cockpit aeroplane, two, a biplane, so two wings. And uh, yeah, you get strapped to the top of it and it takes off and does a little 15 minute circuit. And if, if you're good at wing walking, you know, you can do flips and things like that. If it's your first time, you, you tend to stand there like that. Um, so, yeah, it was an amazing experience. Unforgettable. Well, we'll be sharing, we'll be sharing a, a picture on Twitter later on. Maybe not of you doing it, but of someone else. Now we're going to go from aeroplane wings to, I think, water wings, because we have David Peckinpah, who is the president of Maritz Global Events. But I heard before this session that you have experienced synchronized swimming. Is that true? Uh, unfortunately, it is true. And again, thank you for that. I don't know if I can beat Karina, the wing walking. Wow. <clears throat> but yeah, at our annual meeting every year, I, I try to get our leadership team to do something uh, pretty stupid. And uh, a number of years ago, we did uh, a takeoff of, if anyone knows, Saturday Night Live <clears throat> and the the uh, the skit they did about synchronized swimming. We kind of reenacted that. So we had a, a real synchronized swimming troupe and then several of us in old fashioned bathing suits and nose plugs and and headgear jumped in and did the worst rendition of a synchronized swimming routine that you can possibly imagine. Well, but we have a was... great picture to show, don't we, after this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do, unfortunately. <laughs> now we're uh, going to come back down to earth and down to the lakes or the, the scenic lakeside of Geneva. So Ben Hainsworth, who is the managing director of the European Association for the Study of Liver, moved there a year ago. And Ben, I heard that you were planning to take up stand-up paddle boarding. Can you give us a progress report? You're on mute. Hi, Jane. Hi, everyone. Uh, you said it very well, Jane. Uh, on arriving on the shores of Lake Geneva, I did indeed plan to do some stand-up puzzle boarding, but uh, it's remained remarkably dry so far. Oh, Ben, well, we'll have to catch up with you another time to see if maybe you can get in the water, maybe not before the end of the year, but maybe next summer. OK, now we really want you to be connecting. We want you to be messaging each other on the chat. But if you do have any questions that you want to submit, please make sure you do that on Slido and the information's down the right hand side. So just to make sure you are all familiar, I'm sure, with Slido, but I just want to start off with three very simple poll questions. So perhaps we can show the first one now. We are wanting to find out where, what country you're calling from, because we know there's a huge number of people joining us today. So this would be really good. Okay, maybe, okay. If we don't have these poll questions just now, um, that's that's no problem. We can We can dig straight in. So today the session is connecting people through events in a changing world. And we don't have a lot of time, so we want to focus on three key areas. The first one being we want to understand what's happening in the panels world at the moment. The second thing is we want to discuss community engagement and digital platforms. There have been a lot of wonderful speakers talking about that the, over the last couple of days on Planet IMEX. So we want to hear from our panelists. And then we're going to finish up with future foresights. And we will give you, the audience, the opportunity to tell us what area you would like the panel to share. It could either be um, the, um, an opinion piece, a research piece, or a wonderful out into the wild idea that they have for the future of events. So we'll get to that later. But just to start things off, we want to hear about the panel. So Ben, can you tell us what's, what drives you at the moment in these turbulent times? Well, I started with Easel uh, towards the end of last year, uh, and suffice to say that the year hasn't really gone exactly as uh, expected. 
Uh, so obviously not taking anything lightly. It's been a dreadful year for, for everybody, but it's been um, a great way to get to know the community that uh, I've got the honor of serving. Um, for medical associations, it's been in a sense, a perfect storm because not only have they had their, their personal and family lives thrown uh, thrown around, they've had their work lives uh, thrown into chaos, many of them being on the front line. And then from the association perspective, um, we've had the sort of business modeling question, our operations and our uh, administration really thrown uh, into the unknown. So it's been a year of uh, discovery and I'm being throughout the the period and ongoing amazed by the the resilience of the people that uh, that i serve and the focus which they've been able to find despite of or perhaps in in uh, because of uh, the waters that we're we're navigating through thank you ben you talked a little bit about um regeneration can you share a little bit about that about the liver and how this has affect how you're looking at the association well yeah it's it's a bit anecdotal really but um i was having a conversation with uh with one of our liver specialists and um i think like all organizations we're, we're going through a period where we have much reflection on how we how we're doing things how we've done things in the past mm -hmm. uh maybe some habits which we've grown overly accustomed to uh maybe too much in our comfort zone especially for example coming to uh looking at uh events and um, I was reminded, or actually I was taught for the first time, that the liver is unique, being the only internal organ of the body that can regenerate itself. So uh, that's part of our, our spirit as an organization that can actually uh, regenerate and recover and repair. Yeah, certainly a good positive approach and what we need at this time. Karina, is there anything that you've discovered about yourself during this time? I know you shared back in March that you were taking up piano again or trying to improve your school skills, but is there anything else that you can share that, uh, that, that you've learned? Yes, well, I've probably learned that I won't be a concert pianist anytime soon. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, all of us have learned a degree of resilience um, in this period or certainly learned what that means to us and how resilient we truly are. Um, I think the other thing is that I have truly learned that I am an extrovert. Uh, I knew that already, but, you know, just the um, just going into the office with one or two people there has been so valuable uh, and meant so much to me after, you know, a period of being uh, of working at home. And, and I realized as well that I got my breaks through the events that we attended, through the process of traveling, you know, being on a plane on your own. You, it, it is actually a time when you can get some quiet work done, you can watch a movie, you can rest, uh, just the time you have traveling, you know, being in the airport, things like that. And, and also, you know, the events that we all host in the industry uh, did rejuvenate me because, you know, they, they're fun to attend. You see your friends from all around the world. And I'd always come back and I'd say, you know, a change is as good as a break. And yes, it was tiring being there, but actually I feel rejuvenated having come back. And so I think those things in this period where we're not traveling, we're not uh, attending those events and, and the Virtual events like these are, are fantastic, but it's not the same. Um, you know, you do need to find those times to take a break. And I think I've not been so good at doing that. I'm kind of learning that in hindsight that I need to do that. Um, and the other thing I guess I'm, I've learned is that, you know, over this period, it's been a big learning curve for all of us in, in doing new things. Um, and there's been a certain freedom to that as well. And that's been difficult, but, but also valuable and interesting as well. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. Now, David, in this time when it's not so easy to go to the shops, and I know you're, as well as having tried synchronised swimming, you do like some home decor. Is there anything that you've purchased during lockdown that's enhanced, enhanced your life or your family life? Well, I, it's still to be determined, but I uh, I did buy a blow up hot tub. Uh, I'm too cheap to spend the money on a really expensive hot tub. So they have these really nice ones made by uh, Coleman and Intex uh, that actually blow up and they're fantastic. 
uh, and they're very inexpensive. And so that has been, as we get into the cooler fall months and uh, looking forward to the winter as a way to maybe rejuvenate and relax and, uh, and take care of these old achy bones. So that's one purchase I made. Uh, the kids have used it, but I have not yet. Uh, so I'm oh, looking well, thanks for sharing. Well, it sounds like you and Ben, there's some equipment that needs to be used. We've got the paddle board and you definitely <laughs> need to get in the blow up hot tub. But I'm loving, I'm loving all these words that coming out. You know, we've got rejuvenate that Karina mentioned as well. We've got regenerate. We've got restore. So there's there's lots happening. Now, I'm so sorry that I didn't see the poll questions. I think the technology issues lie with me. But I'm delighted to see so many countries are joining us today. We've got lots from the USA, Mexico, Germany, South Africa. Oh, Curacao, Spain, uh, the Netherlands, to name but a few. So welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Now, we're now going to move on a little bit to talk a little bit more about engagement. So, David, perhaps you could start this one. Can you share how Marits have approached engagement? You know, it's a uh, it's a huge issue. Um, I think this new environment, Karina mentioned, is fantastic, but uh, we've sort of coined a phrase, it fills the gap, but not the void. And what we're seeing is that void that exists of human interaction and that we are social creatures uh, at the core. And so how we engage um, individuals in this lockdown, semi-lockdown um, uh, virtual environment is really, really important. So what we've done is our key word, if you want to add a word to the, to the list, is adaptation. Uh, that's been sort of our, our driver is how do we adapt to everything that is going on to in our personal lives, uh, in our industry, in our businesses, with our partners. It's all about adaptation. And, and to me, that is the key. And so how do we adapt our design practice, which we have a, a, a part of our company called the De Merits Global Events Design Studio. And we've had to adapt to the changing environment. And so we switched all of our design practice to focus in on the digital environment. And engagement is, I think, the number one challenge. Uh, I am sure there are people that are just fascinated by everything I'm saying, but I know that there are other people that are probably on their phone or have the TV going on in the background or a cat walking across their desk or whatever the distraction might be. And not that distractions don't happen in a face-to-face -face environment, but it's very div different in a digital environment. So we've really focused on how do we use design to drive engagement when you have all these different challenges going on in this screen-to-screen -screen environment. Great. Thank you for sharing. Yes, and it's ever moving and we're all learning, as Karina mentioned in one of one of her sessions early, earlier. We don't know what to ask sometimes. We've got so much so much to learn. So it's great to hear what Maritz are doing. So, Ben, can you share any success stories? Because your conference, of course, was virtual this year. I can do. Uh, I'll, I'll come round to it in a second. But I just wanted to share a, a reflection uh, that I've been having. And so obviously for everyone watching this and for us, um, associations are, are almost defined by uh, a drive to actually convene and collect and um, group people around a common cause. Um, and this crisis has rather brutally uh, accelerated our reflections and an evolution on how we do that, on, on how we convene people. Um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, I think that over the years, some of us have come a little bit over dependent on the annual meetings, uh, not all by any means. And many of us have been thinking about this for like 10 years or so. But at the same time, I think there was a degree of denial about that as well. Um, and that's no longer the case. I think that that's uh, that one's been a hit on the head and no one's in denial there. And we are going through a, a real uh, shift in the mindset. And I think you could almost illustrate it by th saying that we're no longer thinking so much about the meeting and we're thinking about meeting. Um, we did indeed, we transited or we pivoted our, our live event in London to a digital event in, in August. Um, and it was absolutely fantastic. We, we, had, we had thrills, we had excitement, we had emotion, uh, we had great figures, we had great numbers and so on. But I think it's very clear to everyone who was involved that, that despite the success of doing that first digital event, it's a one-off. And, and that can't be repeated, it, it won't wash. It, it was great and there were very, very high levels of satisfaction, but we can't do the same thing again next year. So uh, we're really at the beginning of, uh, 
of the new a new era and how we design our events design being uh key to that and i think with with every one of these events that we attend the, the and this one especially included um raises the the bar of expectations for the next one coming along so i think we've got some very busy months maybe even years ahead of us as we uh re-engineer the way that we meet and meet we will do yeah great thank you for sharing and it's also superb it was such a success but as you say, it's a bit of a worry if you can't replicate the great event that happened this year. What have we got to move and change for, for next year? Um, Karina, we're talking about you know, engagement and um, how, how does IMEX measure engagement or what does success look like? Uh, well, I assume you mean in the virtual world rather than our in our live world. It's obviously very different. Um, I mean, we're learning as well in terms of what it means. Um, but I think, you know, for Planet IMEX, certainly this time around, we'll, we'll be looking at obviously not just the numbers that registered, the numbers that actually showed up, um, how many people showed up to sessions, how long they stayed. But importantly for us as well is how many uh, meeting requests were there, how many messages messages were exchanged um, between people and then how many meetings took place. That I think is the kind of holy grail of engagement online uh, because we want to see that one-to-one, um, -one, that, that interaction between people, not just us broadcasting content to people. And it's great if people enjoy that, um, but we're looking at things like, you know, how many comments um, were, were put in, you know, how engaged were people with that content. And then we also look at the social side. So because Planet IMEX for us is also our 3D world, we're looking at, at the interaction on that, the dwell time on that, how many people are going through it, how many new people that, that we didn't know already that aren't in our database, and also then the interaction on our social feeds. So we're kind of taking a lot of different data points. I guess the interesting thing in this world is there are a lot of data points. There are almost too many. So it's about, you know, cutting through to the things that are really meaningful. But, you know, ultimately the difficult thing online is creating interactions, networking, serendipity, Um and so, you know, that that's you're trying to look at data points that are going to give you the answers to that, if there are any. Um, and then you, you're going to get some in, in, anecdotal feedback as well through surveys and things like that. So it's a, it's a whole range, really, um, to see what yeah. where that engagement is really sitting. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, David, you were talking about your design studio can you share anything around the individual engagement? We were talking before this session a little bit about that. Could you share to the audience what Maritz are doing? Yeah, I think one of the, uh, and it was interesting to hear Karina, because you're right, there are so many different data points <clears throat> that you can get overwhelmed by data. One of the things we've been working on for quite a while now uh, is a true engagement measurement. Uh, we've been working with a tech company out of Northern California uh, and we're doing uh, a lot of testing right now, <clears throat> and it's through the use of wearables. And with the biometrics that you can gather <clears throat> through wearables, um, it can really uh, give you a, an idea of the resonance of the event. And you can measure it uh, by speaker, you could do it by slide, you can do it moment by moment. Uh, but it really is, I think, an innovative way to look at the new age of what measurement's gonna look like, because it's not gonna be static surveys, it's not gonna be just clicks or time spent um, in, in, in a site or how long you were uh, logged on to an event like this. But we need those additional measurement tools to really give us an idea of was that audience and was that individual engaged? And if so, where and what was the content that engaged them? And then how do we amplify that? So there are really exciting things coming out of this. Uh, and this new environment has forced us to, to innovate, which is usually the case. Well, that's really exciting because then when we do get back to face to face, um, I think there's going to be a huge shake up in the way content's delivered. The speakers that are presenting, a lot more will be expected of them if you've got these wearables that say, OK, the first few minutes they're engaged and then they drop off. So it's very interesting that you're going into that information and we'll look forward to hearing, hearing more about that. Now, Ben, when we were talking earlier, you talked about um, that your community is growing um, in some different areas. You mentioned about pa patient groups. Can you share a little bit about what's happening with Easel? Yeah. Um, 
I think that one of the um, one of the phenomena that we've seen during this uh, these last few months has been that our co core community has been as demanding, if not more demanding, for for meaningful contact uh, with us as an association and um, and between themselves. But we've also been feeling demand from the outside world. And I think this is something which is happening, perhaps not specifically with associations, but we're definitely getting more um, call for expertise and for opinion and for uh, thought leadership from the public and from patient groups. So there's been kind of a natural outreach uh, towards patient groups and engaging with them uh, over these last few months. Obviously, this has been virtual for the time being. And uh, we look forward to a, a hybrid future next year where we can be actually hosting more patient group representatives in, in the events that we're doing. Um, and then obviously seeing how um, measuring engagement, measuring the engagement of a remote audience alongside the an on-site audience is going to be a, a real challenge. And that's something that we're, we're quite excited about how we can the two communities don't necessarily have the same experience, but they have to have a, 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 an experience which can be aligned and we can get uh, get them interacting with each other. Now, it's really interesting that you're saying that and it will be, I don't know if you're aware of other associations that are finding that as well, but even in this current climate, we do feel that, um, that, that we are bridging the gap in so many ways um, between either personal life and work life or you know you know the UN are wanting to, to to get closer to civil society, and I think it's very interesting that more people are wanting to get under get involved with um, patient groups, as you say, with associations. So it'll be interesting to see what what happens there. Um, I just want to now move on a little bit to hear more about digital platforms. I would like to talk about. So Karina, when we had a chat before today, you were um, talking about that maybe there is a trade off a little bit between engagement and technology. Can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting because, of course, um, one of the things that we wanted to do and one of the learnings really from Planet IMEX in May through to Planet IMEX October was really um, the need for higher level production and design. And, and you know, hopefully people are experiencing that here and just ha have a slicker um, sort of delivery, if you like, of the content. But then in doing that, um, it's harder to get the audience interaction. You know, you end up doing what we're doing. You're, we're using Slido. People can chat. Um, but it's not like a Zoom meeting, is it, where people are in the meeting and they can turn their cameras off and on. So th there is a trade off there, because if you're in a Zoom meeting, it's a Zoom meeting. We all know we've all experienced that now. And, um, it, you know, it, it's not a high quality event. Um, so this is a higher quality event, but then you don't, there's much harder to get that interaction. So I think that's something that, you know, I've over the past few weeks kind of struggled with a bit because actually one of the things that are face-to-face -face events, you know, the thing that is so important is that face-to-face -face interaction and how do you really deliver that online? So I think we, we've we got a little bit of thinking to do as, a, as an industry and, and, and for us as well to think about how do we marry these things up? You know, do you always need the highest level production? And, and I guess, you know, having worked with David and, and the Maritz Global team and the design studio, it's really about going back to those core principles of what your event is for, what the strategic priorities are, and then designing it accordingly, and maybe designing different journeys for different elements. But, um, you know, the, the higher quality production, the more you go towards a TV show, in a sense, the harder it is to interact, because you don't interact with your TV shows, do you, except you know, on Twitter or whatever. And so it's just something that we need to think about, I think, when we're designing these um, online events for the period that, that we have to do them. Great. No, thank you for sharing. Well, I'm I'm loving Planet IMEX, so this is working for me. But I do like when you're in sessions and you can you can chat and connect connect with the audience in in some way, even if you're not seeing their faces. You feel you're growing growing friends around the world. But David, can you share a little bit around um, around digital platforms from a Marit's point of view? You know, it there are so many platforms that are out there, and each one, I think, is Karina's point is well taken, has its own place. Uh, and I think what we've tried to be is a bit of Switzerland when it comes to platforms. 
because we have clients that have already, um, you know, and we serve all markets, right? Corporate association, trade show, live event markets. Um, and so we have to be sort of Switzerland when it comes to, to tech platforms. We have a couple that are preferred uh, and it's really based on what Karina said. It's getting down to the basics of design. What are the business outcomes and guest impressions that you want? What's the organizing principle? And what are the really the key measurements of success? That should drive everything uh, from that design process on choosing what platform makes sense. If you need something that is highly interactive, a Zoom type um, platform is gonna make much more sense. You need something that's much more slick, more about presentation, PowerPoints, uh, video, you're gonna select other uh, platforms. So it, it really, to me, comes down to design. And I think the one thing we learned early on, going back to February, March, is so many planners try to take what they had designed for their live event and just put it into a digital platform and that absolutely just does not work. It has to be thought of completely differently. The design process, while you can follow the same principles, the outcomes are significantly different. And the restrictions on what you can and can't do and how you engage your audience uh, really drive uh, a different kind of design. So for platforms there, I, you know, there's so many to mention, I, I really couldn't pick one or two out other than to say you have to know what your goals and objectives are, what your design intention is and then select a platform that fits that specific event, not just one that's sort of one size fits all. Absolutely, Coming, speaking to the why, why are we doing this? What are we wanting to achieve to make sure you can create the right platform? Um, now I've just, Natasha, thank you, has shared a question that I would just like to, to ask Ben. Ben, somebody's asking here, um, do you think you're going to do more frequent online events or connected regional event hubs? We were discussing just today of doing more uh, more regional events, certainly, as a sort of an outreach program that we'll certainly be uh, thinking of doing. Um, and as I said, the pure digital event that we did this year, I really do consider to be a one off and we're aiming for hybrid events, possibly with with um, on site hubs. Um, and I think that looking back on, on, on the digital and looking at back on the years before, I think we may be misgaged the, the roots for the success of the events that we've always had. Um, we, we curated great content for our, our digital event. The, the, lots of people said that the actual scientific learning was superior to a face-to-face -face event because there was so much available on demand, there was so much available beforehand to prepare. But nevertheless, people were yearning and are yearning to have that social human interaction which happens around the content. Um, and I think that the, um, the solution that we will find for that, we don't yet have. Uh, and it's really the for the for the unstructured for that horrible word serendipity. I said it properly, uh, which is very hard to engineer. Uh, when you have an on-site event, you can just rely on human nature for that to happen. Uh, but I think thinking of design, we'll have to be really deliberately thinking about how we can engineer mechanisms for people to interact uh, in a natural fashion, uh, and hopefully, yeah. uh, hopefully. Uh, on-site or hub activities will help and just much more frequent uh, events be they online or or live mm -hmm. i spoke to an association recently who said they had their online co uh, conference and the people in countries who could get together did end up coming together and being in the same room and watching the content on a screen because they wanted to have that community engagement and be part of something and discuss the topics that were being shared but Ben, um, I have another question for you. Um, you talk a little bit around that the hard things are uh, not being able to have these chance opportunities that you get at a face-to-face -face conference where you bump into people and you can have these great discussions. Can you share some of the solutions that you're working on where you're connecting with other, other associations to be able to, to, to find solutions? I think a lot of it will come down to um, scanning the market and to seeing what all these um, uh, companies are delivering and there's suddenly going to, there's a wave of uh, solutions uh, coming through. Um, it can be a little bit daunting when you're not a naturally uh, techie person uh, like me, but increasingly the, um, the our audience are 
uh, virtually literate um, and a lot of our leadership as well and I'm confident that the that solutions will come along and I'm pretty certain that the solutions we'll have for the next digital events for the next hybrid uh, hybrid events will be like IMEX solution here today um, a, a best of breed where you'll have various solutions being laid on top of each other to to meet the various requirements. Mm, great, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Karina, when we talked earlier, um, you, you shared that there's, in some ways it's it's been surprising in a good way, the digital setting. Can you share any stories where, where you feel it's actually worked quite well? Well, I mean, obviously there are, there are many stories about the reach um, that you can get. Um, and, you know, there, there are certainly, you know, I think for a lot of events, uh, professionals, they're finding that they can attract speakers, you know, from all over the world, very high quality that they might have struggled to um, to, to attract before. And the other thing I would just say from our own perspective is just um, the learning curve. You know, it's been a massive learning curve for us. Um, but I think that's a good thing as well, because we have learned a huge amount over the past six months. We have uh, we are learning to and we have learned how to narrow down those choices for this event in particular. Um, after the first Planet IMEX, we were very deliberate in taking some time to think about what the objectives of the event were in order to choose the right platforms and the right suppliers and and the right structure of of the um, week if you like so that we could bring to it what we wanted so that was why we had a full day of fun sessions it was all about trying to get people together networking having fun whether they were you know watching you know doing um, magic tricks with Mike Super or watching a balloon trip over Turkey um, cocktail making with the Venetian it, it was about that sense of community that's always been really really important to us and, and then this platform as well as well as the content allows those one-to-one -one, um, matchmaking appointments so I think you know we, we've done things quite deliberately and that is all through learning and I'm sure if we do things again you know we'll, we'll do things differently again through learning and the other thing I'd say is you know this period has allowed our team to uh, just work so collaboratively together and differently because we're not doing what we used to do so we're not in our normal teams at the moment and that's been really freeing and, and, and fantastic in many ways for the team so I think there have been lots of learnings uh, both sort of skills um, as well as learnings of, of what people can bring to the table in different ways that aren't necessarily part of, you know, their normal job title. And I think that that's been really fa fabulous, actually, for, for everybody. Um, so those are the kind of things I think that we want to take into the future um, as a business, um, certainly. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, the IMAX team are just wonderful and everyone seems so energized and want to get it done. And I thought it was lovely you shared a story before where you're not running between rooms. You can actually get quite easily into different sessions and be involved, which is another upside to doing something like this instead of being face to face. So thank you so much for sharing. OK, well, now we are going to go to the last part. And this is giving you the opportunity, the audience, to tell us what you would like to hear from the panelists. So you have, uh, Natasha will be sharing the poll since I don't seem to have access, but you will have three options. So we're talking about future foresight and we want the panel to either share a research piece or they could share an opinion piece, which is more around their experience. Or the third option is an into the, into the wild idea for the future of meetings. So I will let that poll run and I'm sure Natasha will tell me when we know if it's going to be one, two or three. Into the wild, I love it. What a great audience, yay. We've not gone for research or opinion. Okay, Karina, can you give us an into the wild idea? Yeah, well, just to say, I think it's fabulous um, into the world because those of you who saw uh, Daniel Fox's keynote yesterday, uh, that really is his theme in terms of, you know, um, into the world and learning from nature. So um, I'm sure that's not what you meant, Jane, but I, I just really like um, the sentiment. I think there are a couple of things, really. I think um, 
on the one hand, I think we should, as an industry, really think through what hybrid will mean in the future, because I think there's a danger that we look forward and we try to design our hybrid events in terms of our understanding of a physical event at a time and space. Uh, that's happening now and therefore we put a part of it online and I think that would be a real mistake so looking to the future I think you know hybrid is not going to mean that in the future I think hybrid means that you have different events for different communities running at different times in different ways and that you truly design for a different audience um, and a different kind of, of future so so that that would be one idea and, and one more if I may just put out there because it's kind of wild and not wild in the sense that if you look at what's happening in countries which are able which have controlled the virus well now and are able to open up in a different way their events don't look so different to what they did a year ago and so another wild idea really is that when we do get this under control and I know that feels like a very long way off for many of us but when we do Another idea is, you know, how different are our events really going to look? Because once we don't need to social distance anymore, are we really going to? Uh, it, is human nature going to change so significantly, sort of millennia of human nature? I'm not so sure. So uh, that would be my other wild idea that things won't be that wildly different. Thank you for sharing. We're going to look back next year or in three years time to see what's happened. David, over to you. What are your wild predictions? Well, you know, we'll argue whether they're wild or not, but I, I do think um, a couple of things I would like to, to, to highlight. One is well-being. I think what we're seeing right now and we're getting feedback from some of our traditional incentive customers that based on everything that's going on in the world and a lot of demographic and what I would say persona shifts that are going on with who is going on uh, our programs, who is attending events. Uh, I think there's going to be a different demand on event organizers um, around well-being and taking into account the whole person, right? Not just the person going to get education or just to the network. Um, and there's been a lot of movement over the last number of years in that space. I think it's going to become front and center, uh, this whole focus on well-being. I think a CSR has been talked about. It's usually in a project mindset. Uh, I think when we're looking at, at customers in the incentive space, for instance, uh, they may be looking at now taking a trip and truly making that entire trip around maybe a mission or a CSR uh, focus of that organization that matches that brand's uh, identity and goals and objectives. So I think we've got a significant shift going on right now that this pandemic is gonna drive just out of nature um, and it will be long lasting uh, as will, uh, I think Karina's point about designing different events for different audiences and different purposes. And the last thing I touched on earlier, I think the, the whole space of measurement, our industry overall, and I'm sorry to be blunt, has done, I think, a pretty lousy job of measurement. Uh, we have a lot of surveys, we have a lot of data points, but I think the evolution of measurement to really take into account the whole person, uh, as I mentioned, using wearables and other bio uh, readings, I think is gonna change the world of measurement for events moving forward. And I think that will drive design and how our events look differently as well, because ultimately, We've got to make sure that we're designing for the individual, designing for the journey, not just the destination. David, thank you so much for sharing. I'm writing lots of notes, sorry, and I was on mute. But we have a question that's come in for, from Eduardo, which I would like you to answer if possible, David. Do you think the vaccine appearance will make a real difference in what the face of future events will look like? You know, this is a big debate. Um, and I, you know, I'm, look, I'm not a doctor. I just have an opinion. Uh, but I focus more um, and, and we focus more in this uh, organization around measurement and treatments more so than vaccine. Uh, I think, you know, if you look at a lot of different health issues that, uh, that are out there uh, that have existed for years and have always been a risk for anyone traveling, getting on a plane, going through an airport, going to a face to face event, those have existed. But we've sort of done that scale of risk reward and said, OK, the reward is higher than the risk. And that's usually because of either effective treatments or effective testing or a combination of the two. So I actually hold out more hope for that being more prominent than a vaccine, because the vaccine, we don't know what the timeline is. We don't know how effective it's going to be. Is the 
Uh, is the virus something that continues to mutate? And, uh, and so I think it's just an unknown area. So for me right now, it's more about uh, treatment and, uh, and testing and in instant testing, right? Uh, which is you're seeing huge improvements in that space right now. To me, that's the goal. Uh, and I think the, the driver of getting back face to face. Thank you. Big question there. But Ben, your wild idea. Well, my, my, my truly wild idea is that the, the next time we're, we're together, we'd be sitting in, um, in a center or a hotel or something crazy like that in front of a, a live audience. Wouldn't that be wild? Um, more realistically, however, um, I think that, that that may happen in, in, due, in due course and in um, response to Eduardo's question there about the, uh, the vaccine and treatment and so on. I was marked by, uh, we were having a, an online board meeting and there was one of our board members from Barcelona and she was a bit shocked that day. And she just said that the one thing she's certain of is that um, she will never be the same person again. And I think that that is likely to be true for, for all of us. So although I've said, repeatedly today that there's a, a yearning to go back to having big live meetings. Uh, I think reality may be a little bit different, whether it's on the supply side or on the demand side or a combination of those. Um, and I think that the the biggest mistake we could make, whether we are on, on the supplier side, the planner side, the attendees side, is to uh, expect a return to normal. Um, in terms of the business which uh, we can we we can be doing, and I think that would 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 lead to to a failure. So I think we all need to give ourselves the time and to give each other the time to really come to the terms with the fact that we have to build something new, and that that will be incremental, and that we will get back to something perhaps uh, like normal, um, but it will be it will be stepwise. Thank you so much, Ben. Now I know we only have a few minutes left. So uh, just in summary, there's so many things that have been shared, so many fantastic words, but I think a couple of things that I just want to highlight is that we must focus on the individual. I think when David said we focus on the whole person, this is who we're speaking to now. We're wanting to create something that's valuable for them. Like David David said yesterday, you know, what they, what they want and then we need to, to deliver what they need, you know. So I think that's certainly one thing. We want to come back better and stronger. You know, we want to take lessons perhaps from the liver. We need to, to regenerate, restore and, and come back better. Um, so I would just like to thank Karina, David, Ben. Thank you so much for joining this session. All of you around the world, wherever you're sitting, morning, night, Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. I've really enjoyed moderating the session and I hope you've all found it useful. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, James. Thank James. You. Have a great show, everyone. <laughs>